Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Sandler. And I'm Bradley Kuhn. And we are so happy to be here at FOSDEM with you. Uh, we both are, did you move forward? I see. Uh, hi, uh, we are both, um, uh, we both work at the Software Freedom Conservancy. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of Software Freedom Conservancy. It's about, yay, it's about half of the room. Um, we are a charity uh, organized to promote free and open source software. Um, we are focused on the ethical and I, I just have to stop for a second and tell you everybody that the sound here in this room is extremely challenging. So you get like a little bit of an echo and in particular during the, the Q&A section you, you cannot hear any of the people questioning. So I just saw Frank give his talk and he kept trying to lean over to hear what everyone said because it's so awkward. And anyway, I just wanted to uh, just stop for a minute and, uh, and just mention that because uh, hearing my own echo is a little confusing. Anyway, I'll, I'll kick it to you, Bradley, for a minute. <laughs> so we spend a lot of time trying to do the right thing for free software. And we try to live a life in software freedom. Last year, uh, the organizers were kind enough to invite us to give a keynote talk where we spoke a lot about that and a lot about the challenges. Today, what we'd like to do is give you a follow-up on that and really lay out some concrete plans of how we as a community can approach this question of how do we do what's right for software freedom, how do we live a life in software freedom, in what is becoming an increasingly challenging world. Of course, it is very, very difficult to be purists now. And in fact, it is difficult for me to ever be a purist at all. Um, I have a pacemaker defibrillator because I have a heart condition. And I can't see the source code in my own body. Um, this is the whole reason why I have become so passionate about software freedom, because when you realize that you have no control over the software that is literally sewn into your body and screwed into your heart, you start to see all of your technology a little bit differently. Um, and having this, um, this, this struggle with proprietary software um, really flushes out all of the issues um, that, uh, that we face. So uh, again, we talked about, we're not gonna repeat the talk we gave last year, um, it, it, it was the summary of all of the thinking of a year ago, and today we are going to tell you about um, all of the work that we've been doing over the last year and where things stand now. So one of the things that we have tried to do uh, and we want to do is to provide moral leadership about software freedom. We, we believe in ethics and morality. We believe that ethics and morality are a central component of why most of us are here, because we have things that we believe in. I've been thinking quite a bit over the last year, in part because of this television show, and I apologize if people don't like examples from television shows, but if you will make an exception for one, this show called The Good Place is probably worth it. It is the first time I've ever seen deep moral philosophy addressed uh, through a comedic uh, lens uh, in the history of television. Raise, raise your hand if you've seen The Good Place. So, <laughs> we have a large audience and maybe half the people yeah. have seen it. Well, that's good to know because it makes our examples much easier to explain. So this main character here, his name is Chidi, and it's not a spoiler to know that he um, is a moral ethicist by training. He's a PhD in philosophy uh, and spends his time thinking about moral questions. In this particular scene, he's spending about an hour and a half to decide which muffin to buy for breakfast. The reason he spends an hour and a half considering this question is because he's considering the entire long chain of moral decisions that occur to bring this muffin to this little stand here near his university in Australia. He's trying to decide what is the most environmentally conscious muffin to buy? What is the most properly resourced muffin to buy? What is the waste stream questions with regard to the wrapper that the muffin is in? And this kind of moral freeze that constantly occurs for people who care a lot about morality, particularly people who focus from a, what's called a conscien, uh, from Immanuel Kant ethics point of view, is very difficult. 
And historically, I've noticed upon reviewing the history of moral philosophy of free software over the last few years that the influence of Immanuel Kant and conscient ethics uh, may have been a bit overdone. Now, I was a huge fan of Immanuel Kant when I first read his work uh, as an undergraduate at university. Uh, but later, I saw this, uh, uh, this uh, movie and Broadway show um, called Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which can, this quote from that uh, show convinced me that perhaps we have spent a little too much time allowing Kant to always get what he wants. There's other ways and other methods to look uh, at how we engage in morality. Yeah, and I think that when we think about the, um, the moral leadership of free and open source software, we see that things have been coming to a head. Um, there have been different ways of thinking about software freedom, and um, the, quite a lot of the controversy that we have had in the last year, as referenced by Frank in his last talk, um, have as it centered around this idea of ethical licenses. And it's this idea that we have, we've, we've chosen to address some of our social issues with software freedom and with copy left and free software licensing generally. And there's a group of people who want to use that theory to apply it to other spaces. And it's completely reasonable to think this because we have, as a movement, been really going out there saying that our movement has this philosophical and ethical component. And yet, at the same time, I think it's been our historic failure to lead as a movement that has caused some of this division that we have today because we have failed to connect software freedom with some of our other philosophical problems. We sort of wind up in the situation that we're in today where we have to figure out where we are and what are the underpinnings of what we're doing. Yeah, in some sense, we've been standing deciding which muffin to buy while other people have been coming forward saying, well, which moral question are you most interested in? And they're more interested in climate change and other issues, which we think are incredibly important. Uh, and they see natural alliance with software freedom. And their first effort to build that alliance is to say, well, we're going to use licenses just like you did to uh, chase those issues. And we haven't built the kind of coalitions uh, that we had hoped we would build historically. Uh, in part because we've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, relatively simplistic uh, moral questions instead of looking at the complexity. Here's a scene from The Good Place where they're considering what is called by moral philosophers the trolley problem. You're on a train moving quickly down a track. You have a track switch option, but if you go one way, you are sure to murder a single person who is tied to the tracks. And if you turn the other way, you're likely to seriously injure a number of people who are attempting to repair the tracks, although there's some chance they might be able to get out of the way. And this kind of moral question is very good to teach students about how to consider moral philosophy questions. But in the real world, things are not always that simple. Although in some cases, maybe they are. I was going to say, you know, I, I, when I look at the issues around my heart device, some of those are very life and death. Um, I guess the closest equivalent to my trolley problem is that if I refuse to get proprietary software in my body, um, I'm sort of choosing between getting a device that might kill me or not getting a device that would save me, maybe, and sort of not knowing what the result of that is. But either case could result in death. And at the end of the day, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a life or death situation. And of course, the question of whether you can actually examine the source code of that device is salient because you can't assure yourself further that it's safe because you can't review it. That's right. And one of the things that I mentioned last year is that um, often these devices are not necessarily made for the use cases in which they're deployed. So for example, when I was pregnant, my defibrillator thought that my palpitation, which is totally normal in a pregnant woman, was a dangerous rhythm. And it shocked me unnecessarily. I totally didn't need that shock. But it shocked me to, to save me multiple times. And the only way I could get it to stop was by taking drugs to lower my heart rate so much that it was hard to walk up a flight of stairs. And you know, I, it's one of those situations where you know, no one had a bad intention, right? The, the 
people who work for device manufacturers are, are people who are working on devices that are meant to help people, right? And it's a total nightmare to have pregnant women getting shocked, but my use case wasn't necessarily an anticipated use case, which stands for the proposition that all of our technology will be deployed in unexpected ways. What else will we be using our devices for that haven't been anticipated by their makers? So last year we talked extensively about the question of proprietary JavaScript, particularly in relationship to Google Maps. Uh, we got a tremendous amount of useful feedback where people pointed out that, well, there's all these great uh, street uh, open street map based uh, mapping applications. Uh, we took the feedback seriously, at, but even when we dig down, it's like the onion where you peel away and the next thing is just another layer. Again, we discover even if you get the free software replacement, you're still trapped by certain proprietary software in the same. Yeah. Like, it, after that talk, I started using Osman a lot more, which is, uh, which is made such great leaps and bounds that it's fantastic, but without using the GPS drivers, I still have a lot of the same problems I had before. And there's, of course, lots of other proprietary bits in there, too, that I try to avoid. Right, and when you begin to look all the way down the stack uh, in any device these days, uh, even if you've replaced the application layer with free software, you find proprietary software in your firmware. You find proprietary software in the broadband or the, um, the mobile network uh, firmwares. And so uh, th this problem is so complicated, and it, it is basically, as we said last year, impossible to use completely free software. A new problem I discovered in the recent ye in the last year. Uh, this is extremely common in the United States. Uh, I hope it's not common in Europe yet, um, but it is coming if it is not here yet. So this is a sign from a local grocery store near me, and you notice the word digital deals. Well, what that means is there are now certain coupons, discounts that you can only receive from a grocery store if you have their proprietary software application installed. And if, of course, you've authenticated with your personal data. So there's not only a proprietary software component, there's a data privacy component. And when I think about the question of, well, you know, okay, I'm, I'm a, a privileged person who doesn't have the absolute need to chase every sale, although I was raised to always find the best price and use every coupon you can find, so it's in my basic DNA to search for the discount. But I think about poor people, underprivileged people, who are now forced to find a device to use, uh, which they may not be able to afford, to get these discounts. And of course, their privacy is being compromised and everything else. So we're in a situation where the, the, this freight train of uh, proprietary software and data privacy are just running right into each other. It's very similar to what happened with DRM. So we had this moment about 15 years ago where there was a question of whether we were going to accept DRM on free software devices. Uh, there was kind of two camps. There was one camp that said, well, we would really like to be able to use Netflix on Linux. Uh, and that was impossible. And there was another camp, uh, I was in this one, of course, which said, no, we should stand against DRM. We shouldn't have it on Linux-based systems. Even if it means we don't get as much adoption, we should take a stand. In the end, DRM has won and became ubiquitous. We're having a very similar crash of privacy and data rights and proprietary software. If this app were free software uh, that I download onto an Android device, I could modify it to remove the privacy compromising stuff and still have it work with the coupons. I'd figure out a way, I'm sure. I'm a good enough programmer to do that. Of course they are not going to give me the source code to this application because they know that's what I would want to do with it. <laughs> that I'd want to be able to use the coupons without giving up my data privacy. So we're in a really tough problem and this is impacting the underprivileged much more than the privileged because they're, the underprivileged people are the ones who need these discounts the most. And really we should be making sure they can get them and here they can't. So it's not surprising to hear that uh, when I refer to a relatively recent pregnancy that I have little kids. Um, and we went on a family trip to Disneyland. Um, I see some uh, reaction to Disneyland. I feel exactly the same way. Uh, Disney is, uh, is certainly a, uh, a, a problematic actor when it comes to a variety of subjects. Um, however, when you have little kids, it's really fun to take them to Disneyland. 
Um, and we planned for this trip. We happened to be in, um, in LA for uh, a family event and we decided to go to Disneyland. It's expensive to go to Disneyland. And so we saved up our money to go and, um, and we made our plans in advance. Um, this is one of those things where, you know, the, the example that your parents set for you sometimes really influences you. And my mother um, is a very serious planner type. And so when she took me to Disneyland when I was a kid, she did all of the research that she could do. She planned a route through the park. She was amazing. What we would eat, what we would do so that we would make the most of our day and have the best time. And for me, you know, I feel that, that pressure to also step up and give my kids the same experience. And so I did the same thing, and I did all of this research. I planned it out. I spent way longer than I should have. Um, I have a lot of things to do, but I spent way longer than I should have going, and I bought, we bought the tickets in advance. We were all set to go. We get there, and I remember that the ticket said something about how with that kind of ticket, you had the ability to skip some lines, uh, some cues in the park. And the lines for rides at Disneyland can be very, very long. And now everybody here is probably aware that given the, the, our talk so far that I won't put unnecessary proprietary software on my phone. So of course, and I, I don't have the ability to do it on the fly anyway. And so when I found out that Disneyland requires their proprietary app in order to skip the lines, I was like, oh no, I don't have that app on my phone and there's no way for me to do it. My husband, who um, you know, has a, an older Android phone, sometimes will put apps on his phone. And so you know, I said, why don't you try to download that app and we can use it. Turns out his phone is too old to use that app. So we get there and we realize that in fact, because we have old devices or because of my ideological choice to not use proprietary software, that we were going to have to wait in these long lines while other people like literally walk to the front of the line. And I was thinking, this can't, this can't be right. And you know what, Karen, you're a free software activist, right? You're an executive director. Like, you should say something about this. You're a Karen, talk to the manager. So, so I, I went to, there's this uh, like uh, uh, customer service area of, um, of Disneyland where you can go and talk to, um, to, to people who will help you. The, the women that were there bore a striking similarity to the Janet character in The Good Place. Um, I am pretty sure that she's based on these Disneyland customer service representatives. Um, they were so nice, so helpful, um, impeccably dressed in kind of a similar way with like tweed vests and things. Um, I, I can't remember exactly what they were wearing. But, wait, wait, um, wouldn't Disney have the bad Janet? <laughs> <laughs> these, these, these Janets look like good Janets. Um, and so I went and I got, worked up, the, I, I was hesitant, but I went over and talked to them and I said, you know, I explained the situation about, you know, I, 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 you know it's always a good time to talk about free software. So, so I first lead with, I, I don't like proprietary software, here's why. I told them the story of my heart divide, yeah, gave them the whole thing. And, um, and, and they were, you know, they were a little, a little surprised. Um, and, um, and, and then I explained that my husband's phone was old. And so even though we were willing to overlook these ethical concerns to just get through a nice family day, we couldn't. And the Janets were really surprised. They said they had, they, no one had ever complained to them personally about this before. Um, and I realized that it's because if you don't have the money for a current phone and you've saved to go to Disneyland and you get there and you realize that you don't have the access that other people have, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to go and admit you can't afford a new phone. Not everyone is saying, it's about software freedom and therefore I can go and talk to you. No one, you know, most people aren't not most people aren't gonna do that. They're not gonna be a Karen, right? They're gonna they're gonna sink back into themselves and um, and just wait on the lines. And they and their children will wait longer just because they're poorer. And it was this 
fascinating thing. The Janets were great. They did the right thing. They gave me a new, um, they gave me a, like, a, like this something that was like a, a notice that was attached to my paper ticket so that I could go on a special line at a few of the rides and skip them. So they had the right result in my case, but it was such an interesting way of realizing that these issues around proprietary software are designed into every aspect of our lives and in places that you just don't think about. Why on earth would this be necessary to go, go on rides at Disneyland, you know? And the class issue about it was really interesting, especially when, for all of the things that Disney does wrong, they really have thought about issues of trying to make all of their customers feel, um, you know, feel not feel bad about, about not being able to afford things. Like if you go and order um, a food item at one of the food, food carts, you know, it, it, unlike other places in the United States where they'll say, would you like to supersize that? Or would you also like this special cup? Or would you also like this or that? When you order something, like I'll just have, the, I'll have the popcorn, they just say, great, I'm going to give you the, this regular popcorn. And it, that's very meaningful if you're there with little kids, because if you're there with little kids and someone says, oh, well, there's this Elsa popcorn that costs $5 more, the kids are going to say, oh, I want that special fancy popcorn. So it's clear that Disney has thought about these issues because they're very unified and all like if you go and buy um, any kind of swag. But at the, at the end of the day, they had not thought about this aspect of this of their, their digital technology. And these thoughtless decisions are being, are being woven into all kinds of technology in all kinds of ways. Yeah, and while I heard all these groans in the audience when Disney was mentioned, uh, there was a story uh, last year that the uh, largest search on the internet, even though it was only around for three months of last year, was Disney Plus, right? So we're in a bubble here as free software activists, as people who care about free and open source software. And most of the people in the world are facing these kinds of choices on a regular basis. And it is our job to explain to them why and how these choices mix in with the issues of software freedom, how they're making choices about software that are bad for their software freedom, bad for their data privacy, bad in a number of different ways. So, we as activists, of course, are going to sometimes have to live in that real world. We've just given you two stories of how Karen and I have lived in that real world, and I'm sure you all have many of your own. One of the strategies that I talked about briefly last year, and I'll give a little more detail on today, is this idea of just having that one device where you put all your proprietary software. This is an idea, there's actually somebody who's in the audience right now who suggested this to me. It's like, well, just get one device. We get some Android tablet, which is in fact what my dad gave me, as I talked about last year, uh, un un unrequested, by the way. Uh, and that particular device is where I've slowly started putting all the proprietary software, like the, uh, the grocery store apps I talked about, on there. Now the, now, the problem with this is in a number of different directions. But one problem I want to identify that I didn't mention in previous talks is that, in some sense, this is kind of the worst approach for your data privacy. Because now I have the one place where all the spying apps are in my life, which means they can all talk to each other, and I'm sure they all are, telling each other all about all my habits, all my things, giving all my data back to all of the folks who do massive data collection to market more things to me. Uh, and indeed, uh, even at my IP number level, the level of marketing accuracy has shot up unbelievably, simply because I have this one device. So even when I see ads on my fully free software browser, notwithstanding proprietary JavaScript, of course, it knows, because I've used the same IP number, that uh, all the stuff that I've done on these various proprietary things. So I actually think the proprietary dumping ground, while it seems like it's a good option, it's like, oh, I just have this one little boxed-in sandbox where I allow proprietary software. In some sense, it's worse. I'm actually starting to think maybe having one proprietary program on a different free devices might be a little better with regard to Davis, uh, to data privacy. Yep, and to avoid those apps is to pay more, right? I mean, so I... I I, when I choose to avoid them, as I do often, it means that I have to pay more, and not everyone can afford to do that. Yeah. So there's been this uh, hypocrisy that we've talked about quite a bit uh, in, our, uh, in, our, in other venues uh, with regard to how free software advocacy was done historically. 
I think this idea of telling people that they should be pure, telling people that they should be ashamed if they're using proprietary software, um, is something that is quite frankly toxic. I am certainly still willing to tell people who write proprietary software they're doing something wrong because they're actively participating in the production of new things that are bad for people. But someone who's using proprietary software is facing a difficult moral choice and we shouldn't tell them to stand there and decide between two muffins, neither of which is really the best option. We should tell them they have to pick one, but really think about what the implications are. Yeah, I mean, last year uh, here at FOSDEM was the first time Bradley and I confessed that we were using any, you know, any real amount of proprietary software at all. That was the purpose of last year's talk. And, um, and the, the outpouring of, um, of, of, of confessions from people in the audience and, um, and the gratitude of people who were living in shame because they care so much about software freedom but are relying on so much proprietary software every day was really overwhelming. I think a lot of people, you know, don't understand these choices that we make. They're invisible. Just like in a muffin, you don't often know whether you have, um, you know, what, what the ingredients are inside the muffin. It's the same kind of issue with software freedom. I think people don't really think about the ethics of their technology. They just see something really glossy and, um, and know what they have to use. But once you know, it's, it's so hard to make those choices. And now that, um, that, we've, uh, now that we've admitted that we use some proprietary software, I think it's been amazing to hear how everyone else is also using proprietary software and how we have to just simply accept it and be thoughtful about it. So if you take one thing away from this talk, I would like to ask, shaming people for using proprietary software should end here and it should end now. Don't do it anymore. And it's an inspiring and exciting thing to say, and it's such a relief, but it doesn't make us feel any better. It sucks, because we should still be talking about proprietary software, and we should never stop working towards using as much free and open source software as we can. So instead, we need to start educating people respectfully. So as I said, it's never a bad time to talk about free software. I spent about 15 minutes in uh, talking to an immigration official on my way into Belgium, um, just about like, what conference are you going to? Well, <laughs> it's all about software freedom. And so he was really, you know, he had, hadn't really thought about it, hadn't really heard it. And there were so many of you coming through immigration that, uh, that he was really excited to hear what it was about. And I think people are, are, are curious about it. They understand it, that there's something going on. This has changed over the last few years. We have had so many issues that have been connected to software freedom, that are connected to issues around ethics and tech, that people understand they should have a vague distrust of the technology they rely on. So there are so many opportunities that we never had before. And so we shouldn't be ashamed but that doesn't mean we should in any small way give up. But don't feel that you have a constant moral obligation to do this. In a conscience system, this is not a high moral imperative, to put it in conscience terms. Do the best you can to talk to people. Uh, Karen is a person who's particularly good at meeting people where they are and is exuberant and able to talk to people, so she's able to do that. To be quite frank about it, the only thing I said to immigration was, please stamp on page 12 because I already have a stamp there and I'm trying to save pages. So you don't have to advocate at every moment, but look for them and when you're comfortable, when you feel safe doing it, when you feel able to meet someone where they are and tell them about why you care about free software, do so. But don't feel any shame or any bad feelings about not being able to do it as much as you would like. Just keep working on it. There's been a lot of discussion about sustainability how do we stay, sustain this field? How do we pay maintainers? How do we avoid various disasters? And what I found is that often those discussions wind up being about how to sustain for-profit interests in open source. We need to talk about sustainability from a movement perspective. We need to talk about how ideology fits with 
making a future for us and our technology. The sustainability discussion cannot be about how money flows around in this space. While money is important, it has to be about how can we make technology that we can control in the long run and how can we function as a community. How can we work with companies so that they, they do things on our terms, so that we don't have a distrust of our basic devices. The approach to sustainability, which has just become such a huge bu buzzword, and I often say in talks, I thought that sustainability and free software was going to be about connecting up to other ethical issues. For example, how to help prevent climate change with free software, because that's usually what I think of when I think of sustainability. Karen is quite right that most of the discussion has been about how do we fund developers at the same level to which Silicon Valley is funding proprietary software developers. We're going to talk in a minute about some of the ways that we're looking at ways to fund developers, which we agree is incredibly important. But sustainability, if we're going to talk about it in terms of how to keep our FOSS communities going, has to be holistically approached. We have to think about how do we sustain our moral bandwidth? How do we sustain ourselves from becoming burned out? How do we continue to care about our cause while figuring out what trade-offs we have to make every day? We have to look at it from all those different angles. Our technology is not sustainable unless it lets us live in freedom. The fact of the matter is, I think the biggest sustainability problem is that not that we're not writing enough FOSS. Tons is getting written. Every day, more FOSS is being written than has ever existed in history. However, I feel that most for-profit companies, from my point of view, are basically writing the wrong free software. The priorities are in the wrong places. They're focused on software that is going to increase their ability to move forward in their businesses. They're focused on software that they can use as a component or as a base system, open core style, for some larger proprietary system that they're creating. While that software is good, and it's good that we make constant inroads, it's very good that Linux has won on the server market. It's very good that people have at least some base software freedom with regard to their base operating systems. There is still lots of stuff being written that is not the thing that people face most in their daily lives trying to uh, deal with the proprietary software they have to use. In some weird sense, because of the corporate interest in FOSS, companies have a lot more software freedom than individuals do each day. Yes, and I think it's not terribly surprising that, um, that companies have jumped on board, this, jumped on the sustainability discussion and have pushed forward these questions about the flow of money and less about how do we create technology that we can rely on. Um, it's not a huge spoiler to say about, it's a maybe tiny spoiler to say about The Good Place. And please, if you uh, come up to talk to us after this, I have not seen the end. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a huge spoiler to say that the characters in The Good Place get better over time as they know each other and as they work together. Um, one of the things that struck us after our talk last year when we came and we confessed to you all of the things that, all of the proprietary software that we use, um, that together we can, we can, we can support each other. It was, it was the, one of the most surprising things to see how unifying it was amongst people who were all so wrought about all of the proprietary software that they're using when they are software freedom activists. Yeah, and I, I feel that that's the most important thing. I got involved in free software because there were communities of people doing things together. There were people that I respected and became my friends that I worked together with. I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do as a free software activist if I didn't have uh, folks like Karen, who is not only my colleague but a personal friend, whom we stand together and work together and support each other in doing this. And I think as a larger community, we have to do that for each other. And talk to each other and be willing to admit to each other where we're struggling with how to make our work sustainable, how to continue our projects. It's okay to say to somebody, I'm a maintainer and I don't know how to do it anymore, uh, rather than run to some company quickly and say, give me a bunch of money because I'm a maintainer and don't know how to do it anymore. Tell your friends first in the project. Try to figure out how to work together to interact with those entities. One of the things that's happened with uh, free software funding is companies have discovered that hiring a maintainer, bringing them inside, and kind of getting control of their workflow 
uh, has become a method for controlling and changing the direction of free software projects. Your colleagues and your peers are the people that can support you best. And this is the only way we're going to write those alternatives. Right, like I, I, I applaud the sustainability discussion overall because it's important that people be able to create livelihoods and I didn't mean to sound like there was, um, you know, there's no value in that. Um, but we have to think big picture and we're never gonna solve those big problems unless we really band together and work hard because we're already behind. So we keep saying, well, it's not about money, but we know that funding your work, funding free software work is essential. Like, people need to get salaries. That's been the debate in the free software world, the obsession with free software business models. We heard Frank talk about that in a previous session, which folks on the video can find in the Fosden Video Archives. We believe deeply in funding free software. We think that there are careful ways you have to go about it. We do a tremendous amount of funding free software developers through conservancy. And the reason that Karen and I put so much work into making Conservancy successful was so that there could be a place that the important free software projects that are focused on individual user rights and freedoms and to make users' lives better could receive funding in a way rather than through a for-profit company who ultimately has to chase making their company profitable and successful we have to survive, but we don't have to make a profit. We are required, in fact, by the USA charity regulators where we're based to act in the public good and to fund work in the public good. So we're able to fund developers in a way that we tell them, go out and do what's right for the project. It all has to be free software. That's our rule. That's the, our mission. But do it in a way that's making people's lives better, that's helping people. That's the accountability we want from the developers we fund. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of control, and when you have this happening in a charitable environment, it makes it much easier to work on the issues that matter. And I'm proud to say that we have about, something like we pay around 120 uh, contractors to work on free software every year. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, I want yep. to give two brief examples of projects that we've worked with. So the Inkscape project, which is one of the oldest free software projects we have, uh, they have been amazingly uh, dogged in their determination to replace proprietary uh, graphics, uh, proprietary graphic design programs. And to, to be frank about it, that space has gotten even more horrible with regard to how licensing works. Many of you may not know because you don't use, because like us, you don't use proprietary software most of the time. Uh, you may not realize that the Adobe Illustrator biz business model changed from being, you could buy the software, the old school proprietary model, you bought a box set of the copy and you paid a certain amount for it, you could install it and run it for as long as you want. Uh, they ended that years ago. All the current versions are subscription models. If your device doesn't connect to the internet once a month to confirm that you've renewed your monthly subscription to Adobe Illustrator, it stops working until you do. There are people out there that are having that moral choice between two muffins. They're looking and saying, well, I have my old copy of Adobe Illustrator from years and years ago that has some bugs and problems, but at least it is the one that I don't have to pay monthly for. Or I can use Inkscape, which is great, but doesn't have all those features yet. Uh, so we're trying to make Inkscape the easy choice. We're trying to make it easy to say, we can use Inkscape, and it has all the features that Illustrator does, and not only is it free as in price, so we don't have to pay these monthly subscription fees, but it's free as in freedom to assure that you're not going to be exploited by a proprietary software company in the way that Adobe is exploiting its users. And the impact is amazing because, um, you know, we'll get tons of tiny donations from people who are so grateful to use Inks Inkscape. You know, $10 donations from people saying, this changed my life. Um, yeah. Similarly... So, to give an example we, with what Inkscape we do, we fund all of their hack fests and send people around the world to do the hack fest. In the case of this other project, Godot, uh, which has a booth here that you can go and see them, and they also have, a, I believe, Karen, they have a conference uh, coming up soon. Yeah, GodotCon, it's, it's right after FOSDAM. And we are funding, I think, four different contractors, some of them full-time, on a monthly basis to work on Godot. And it's disrupting how game engines, how game software is being built, because there's a fully free software game engine now that people are using. Uh, and it's often the toast of some of the otherwise proprietary game development conferences that they go to to talk about, because it's 
reducing the barrier to entry into the gaming world in the same way that, that, that uh, lots of different technologies for cloud and so forth reduce the barrier of entry into those places. So we believe chasing these new locations where free software is by far not the default, where free software is rare, is absolutely essential. And putting funding there and funding the developers in a charitable way is essential to getting f towards software freedom. Funding contractors isn't the only way that we, um, that we work on this. Can you move the next yeah. slide? Yeah. Um, so our, our enforcement work is a really important component of this. Um, it's amazing that so many people buy so many devices where they should have the right to see the source, to, to, to receive the source code on those devices in such a way that they could replace the software on those devices. But because violations on the GPL are so common, um, it means that that's almost never the case. Um, so these rights are, are, are baked in and they travel with this software and yet they are being included in surveillance devices that people are using in all, way, all kinds of ways in their lives. And so um, being able to use GPL enforcement as a lever to, um, to help us replace those devices with ones that we can we, we, we can rely on is, is important. And it's, so that's one of the things that, uh, that we focus on. What keeps me going every day in this work is quite frankly the fact that Linux changed my life. I downloaded Linux in 1992 and installed it on the laptop that I had just bought and discovered software freedom. And Linux is the most important free software project ever written from my point of view. And it breaks my heart to see the next generation of Linux users not able to do what I was able to do. Because when I downloaded Linux, it was under the GPL and fully compliant. I got a bunch of floppies. I got all the source code. I was allowed to modify it and improve it. Most people who get Linux today can't do that because, quite frankly, most devices running Linux today are violating the GPL. And you don't have the source code and the ability to modify and reinstall it. And that's why we work on this, because we believe Linux is important for the future of software freedom and for all software users everywhere. We have a lot of exciting announcements coming soon, and, um, and mm -hmm. we'll keep you posted. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's no, we, we have oh, to. Yeah, we we're both trying time. to switch it We're one. fighting sorry. now on slides. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow, we are going to have a lot of conversations about Copy Left and how it impacts us and our sustainability. Um, it's, uh, you can register at copyleft.conf. It's here in Brussels, so um, yeah. please consider I wanted, joining. I want to just go back for a moment uh, to this point to say that we're, we're looking this year about how to marry these two approaches. We, we believe that GPL enforcement, is essential, GPL for, uh, enforcement for Linux is essential to software freedom. We believe funding software development is essential, and we're going to look at some projects of how to marry the two together. We have a podcast, faith.us. <laughs> and thank you so much for listening to us and for supporting Conservancy and our work and for all of the work in software freedom that you individually do. So, so I want to remind everyone what Karen said at the beginning. If you watch lots of old Fosden videos, you, you will wonder why the speaker in Janssen that never answers the question that was asked, you're going to ask a question, we probably won't be able to hear it up here. Give it a try, but if we answer the wrong thing, don't, please understand. <laughs> and you can ask us anything about conservancy, about enforcement, about outreachy. There are questions. I scared everybody off by saying we wouldn't be able to hear them. <laughs> Oh, we're want being us, told to go to the middle. They want us together. Sure. Yeah. Oh, they want us to get. Oh. Hello? Yeah. Hi, I had a bit quick question about. You mentioned using proprietary software like apps on phones and things like that. Uh, something that friends and colleagues have mentioned to me recently is sort of taking a more active approach to um, sort of protesting, having to use them by deliberately feeding bad information to the. By deliberately that feeding bad feeding bad information to oh. them. What's your moral take on that? I mean, I would never encourage anyone to violate something that they agree to. 
Um, so if you've agreed to terms and conditions that say you won't do that, you should not violate it. Uh, but one thing I do encourage you is to check the terms and conditions of what you're agreeing to to find out if that's in there. I notice that a lot of people, it's just become so common to click yes all the time. The millions of pages of legal mumbo jumbo that everybody's had to agree to uh, is very disheartening. So read those agreements at least and see if you're, see if it speaks to that issue. If it does not speak to that issue, I think it's absolutely fine to feed uh, incorrect data into a system that allows you to do it. Also, always exercise your offers for source. If you get a product that says there is GPL code in here or you're, this has open source and it has rights, always ask for the source code. Always ask, and if you can, check that it, it, what they sent you is, is right. Questions? Oh, here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, is live? Okay. Um, two questions. First question: um, If, um, if, uh, for example, there is a uh, voting or referendum app in a in a town in Germany already out and it's closed source, um, uh, what could uh, could could the uh, as soft free, software freedom conservancy kind of uh, help in any way um, to? Um, Get that. Uh, get get the weaknesses exposed and the uh, the app replaced by open source software or free software. Actually, uh, if not, uh, what would be an alternative, uh, a European alternative uh, to um, help there? That's the first question. What do we do? The question was, what do we do for times when there's implementation of proprietary software when there really should be free software, like in voting um, apps as there, uh, voting software as there has been recently? What can Software Freedom Conservancy do to help with the situation? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we try to do a number of things. Public education is one of those, uh, the major things that we try to do. I am so frustrated because I thought when I started in this field, longer ago than I would like care to say. I thought it was just a matter of waking people up to this problem. I thought so naively that I would just say, look at the facts, look at this, look at this situation. And that as soon as we would have one failure, everyone would realize, oh, actually, if we had access to our source code over time, we'll have be able to make the fixes that we need and we'll be so much better off that we shouldn't entrust single corporations, with blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think another, uh, to your point, another important thing to look to is, uh, is how to get things done with, particularly like with voting, where you're interacting with the government uh, by doing it without using the software. So an example that we use, we file our paperwork with the United States uh, on paper, which is more work for us, but we choose to do that work rather than electronically file because there's no way to electronically file in the US without proprietary software. So as an individual, standing up and saying, complaining to the voting authorities in your country that I don't want to use this proprietary software app to vote, you should give me an alternative, and collective action is really important. Yeah, and the only way you'll get people to change in an individual way is when you get personally involved in their community. You get, you get as involved in the community as you can and you build trust. And we have to be honest that a lot of our solutions are not, as, are, you know, are not at the point as proprietary software. And so, you know, I, I find that, for example, going into schools, you know, you have to have suggestions for things to do differently. Uh, so you would go on the record to uh, recommend uh, uh, the citizens of Tübingen to vote not by app, but by, uh, by, by paper. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, uh, second question. There's a, this, this is a complex problem uh, because it's distributed. Uh, if it's up close and personal, like a uh, pacemaker or defibrillator, um, okay, there are no kneeling benches here. This is not the Catholic um, University, but um, how could you help with that? Um, uh, trying to get a, um, a defibrillator um, uh, built uh, by just bypassing the entire, um, the entire uh, software stack and doing it in hardware. Okay, this is a loaded question. Um, and so we'll move on to another question. This, the medical device space is fraught with difficulties and there are a number of initiatives to now um, that are now working on medical devices with, with free and open source software, which is a, a, a great move. Yeah, and I think uh, taking the smaller steps, like a lot of times you can't jump right to the most complicated and you know, inside body embedded medical device. Uh, there are people on more peripheral medical devices where the regulations are a little more lax. Um, there's a community of free software developers uh, who work on CPAP uh, machine firmware 
for example. Uh, so those are places where you can look to get involved with those communities. And in my observing of those communities, a lot of them are not very well versed in the traditional issues like free software licensing. That community I just mentioned had a huge complicated licensing argument recently. And I was really hoping someone who had more knowledge about that would get involved to help them through those issues. There's lots of places where people are beginning to write free software that didn't traditionally write it, and they don't know the history and how things work in our community. There's lots of opportunities to join those communities and help. Yeah. Even in the open APS community, where it is the, the diabetes community, where it's very regulated, there's a lot of opportunity. The only problem is that the medical device companies are, are wisening up because they see that people are getting a better result with their own technology and their own software, and so they're introducing some of the features that cause that to begin with. Where's the next? Yep. This is the last question. Thanks. Hey, uh, I've just been to a workshop yesterday, and it was about the open source observatory from the European Commission. I don't know if you have heard of it. They are looking for feedbacks about how to build guidelines for open source communities in the public sector. And I believe that you guys have a lot of nice ideas that they should listen to. Have you linked to them? Um, I heard some of that, but not who ran the workshop. We'd be glad to talk to you after to get linked up with whoever it is. But we didn't hear you because of the audio, so I apologize. Yeah, I, we couldn't <laughs> hear exactly who you said, but there are a number of initiatives to create policies, uh, and we're happy to participate in any and all of them. It's tough because there are so many, and it's hard to know which ones will result in, um, you know, in the policies that actually move forward. But we have to we have to participate in every. And this is where you all come in, where we we can't. We're a tiny organization at Conservancy. Our full-time staff is only five people, and we run outreachy. We have all our fiscal the, sponsorship. We do, we're trying to do contract patch, where we help people renegotiate their employment agreements with some collective power. You know, we're, we do GPL enforcement. So we need volunteers, we need people to get involved, and we need to do so in a coordinated way. I just point your attention on that, because they are uh, looking for feedbacks now, uh, around the beginning of February, and they have an online survey you can take if you yeah, want we, to. Yeah, we can't really hear you, unfortunately. So uh, but please talk to us later. We have a stand on the second floor of K, so please come by there to tell us about it later. And anybody else who would like to become a supporter of Conservancy to help us have more resources, uh, please come by there as well and join as a supporter. Yeah. Thank you so much.